Okay, so um, this week we're looking at um, punk scene again, the research I was doing in that area. Um, but uh, we're concentrating more here on the ways that the, the struggles, I suppose, that aren't necessarily part of the scene itself about creativity and art, but more about um, some individuals in the scenes that try and kind of make a living out of um, out of you know what they've learned and what they do around these scenes. So I'm going to do this across three parts as, as well as, as, as usual. Um, but first bit is on subcultural work and DIY scenes. So um, there's a lot of interest in this academically, particularly in the kind of future of work realm that we'll look at in future weeks. Um, the way that kind of people increasingly have to be entrepreneurial and try and construct a, a work life um, in an increasingly um, precarious um, and casualized labor market. So we've seen the rise of the creative industries over the past couple of decades, and that's particularly precarious, a precarious kind of um, institution. Um, the people that we're talking about in this uh, in this week's work aren't really all that interested in the creative industries. They want to work outside of that. They see that industry as a bit of a sellout as well, although they do kind of cross into those fields as well. So the young people aren't in this aren't seeing themselves as creatives in that sense. So it's kind of seen as a hipster thing to revert to earlier stuff in the course. Um, but they want to kind of make a make a life, make a living, a lifestyle um, out of the things they want to invest in, like being, uh, which is part of this kind of punk scene and creative scenes. So I'm going to use the term subcultural capital here, um, a development of Bourdieu's, of idea, uh, 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 Bourdieu's idea of cultural capital, which um, allows us to think more specifically about which um, forms of capital are useful for getting ahead and lubricating success in, in what I'm talking about here today. What's important about this is in terms of doing, um, getting ahead and making a, a bit of a living in this scene is it's not as much DIY, do it yourself, but there's a kind of element of DIT, doing it together. Um, so there's kind of circles of mutual support and networks that make it, um, are important mechanisms to get um, projects off the ground in particular. So again, this work is across the East Coast and I, I went through some of that methodology stuff last week. So importantly here, while like there's a kind of strong argument today that the very idea of selling out doesn't exist anymore, in some particular subcultures and scenes it does. So there's a kind of balance here between this kind of DIY way of um, getting your own kind of pathway into work um, and making decisions that still kind of correlate with the punk ethos. Um, so there's managing these um, lines all the time between alternate and mainstream and, you know, commercial and alternative and all this kind of stuff. So... Um, in particular, the young people in this kind of realm often have kind of invested themselves in doing all the right things, you know, getting the degree or whatever and going out of the world and with work and seeing that it's really not all that satisfying. The more work doesn't the careers they're kind of um, trying to produce are about, you know, opening a venue to have um, have the kind of the gigs in, um, opening a gallery, opening a clothes shop. Um, and things like that um, are, are important things that these people do. Um, and it's seen as kind of being able to kind of invest in your own tastes, support the scene, but also, you know, get a bit of a living out of it. So subcultural capital is the idea that this kind of knowing about these kind of more niche alternative things can be valuable, um, can help you get along and um, make a life, uh, get some cred in a scene. But what I'm interested in here is the way that kind of, you know, knowing about a kind of really good band or the right record label or to go out a bit further, having good tastes in wine or knowing the right beer, how these kind of niche knowledges come into conflict, I suppose, when you're trying to set up a business with more kind of mainstream economic concerns. Um, knowing, you know, who all the good bands are on um, in the underground scene isn't necessarily kind of seen as key knowledge when you're talking to a bank manager to try and get a loan to kind of open a place. So there's these interesting kind of tensions that happen between, um, you know, probably having the wherewithal and the knowledge to open a business, but then how if you move out into the kind of more straight world, um, those knowledges don't kind of translate into what some of those people want to hear. So... In terms of building these things, we need to think about how this kind of notion of subcultural capital is kind of developed from um, from Thornton, um, and particularly as Thornton's work was done kind of in the 90s before the internet, the way the internet itself allows an, 
opens up the kind of what the spaces of subcultures are. This is particularly important for thinking of the way that people develop networks and also the way that knowledge circulates around outside of kind of individual geographical places and um, kind of has influence and connections all over the world. Now, this happens in a number of ways in terms of the way the taste circulates, but it also happens in the way that um, people support each other. Um, and what's interesting in the work that I did, that there's a particularly supportive network up and down the East Coast and goes through all out Australia in this kind of underground um, scene where people sleep on each other's lounges. If they're touring, they um, help each other out in various ways. Um, and this kind of ability to communicate on a more daily basis, uh, be able to get to know each other even before you meet in person, all these kind of things lubricate those, those um, advantages, I suppose. But there's this ongoing tensions when you're trying to set up a business or even like set up something to kind of do as a side hustle or whatever. Um, between this kind of the networks where there's distinction going on in them and the way these things can be co-opted. And I kind of used the examples previous weeks of the way that kind of some of the bands I was talking about even killed off their bands as they became more popular because they were worried about this, these kind of aspects. So... In terms of thinking about scene and, and, and Will Smith's um, very prominent work on this, um, it's important to think about these kind of paths of circulation and these logic, logics of articulation, the way they come into contact. That's Will Straw, by the way, not Will Smith. <laughs> it's not the guy from Many Black. Um, so what do these kind of things do is kind of constantly, what, what the kind of internet does and the way that kind of these things develop is there's a kind of blurry line between insider and outsider. And this is kind of policed, but it also can be infiltrated. And this is a kind of worry for those in the scene sometime. And there's various mechanisms used to kind of maintain these distinctions. So Thornton in her work about subcultures outlines this kind of us versus them model in terms of, you know, who's an insider and outsider. But what I'm going to show you here, there's kind of multitude of them, so that the opening up of the internet, but particularly kind of taking that subcultural capital out into the more economic circumstances and trying to do something with it there opens up um, many more kind of things that need to be managed, many more struggles and many more kinds of problems to solve. So this speaks to the idea that transferability of your subcultural capital, turning your kind of subcultural knowledge and practices into a career, transferability and convertibility of those things becomes really important. And class is blurry here, um, you know, in terms of cultural capital and economic capital. Um, but really the people that do this stuff well are quite reflexive about their position in the world. Um, they, you know, are managing that balance between the selling out and the co-optation this kind of delicate conversation to have in those kind of things. Um, but where kind of subcultural capital is often aligned with rebellious things, increasingly, you know, late capitalism has um, kind of co-opted this rebelliousness into its kind of very logic. The likes of Boltanski and others talk about how the artistic critique of capitalism has been enrolled in it. And so those lines are increasingly blurred. So what people in these situations do is kind of have to constantly, um, you know, have a balance a delicate kind of um, struggle, I suppose, for thinking about how to kind of keep their cred, but also, you know, open them, uh, be able to kind of open up a business and be able to have um, enough money to be earned to kind of live, which is also um, delicate in the sense that many of the people that are participating in these scenes themselves don't have a lot of money, can't, you know, go out and spend, you know, Ten dollars on schooners or whatever, and so there's kind of interesting things that go on here in terms of maybe opening up spaces to other people sometimes to let them in to make some money, and then like have other times where it's just more about the scene. So knowing how to kind of manage these blurry lines is really important. So an example is a bar that's opened up in Newcastle well over ten years ago now. It no longer exists. Um, and the owner at the time had, had done a, almost a decade of touring around Australia, making music, selling tapes, de developing kind of some serious cred, had run a bunch of small kind of festivals. He got um, access to a rundown um, bar that was closed at the time and turned it into a, a venue that on downstairs had kind of quite fancy cocktails and wine and upstairs had a space to have gigs, show films and stuff like that. <laughs> 
at the time in Newcastle, there was a real move to try and um, open so-called Melbourne style bars. So it was kind of no big screens, no pokies. The aesthetic itself that really kind of matched the scene in that sense. And the aesthetic here is used as a way of kind of forming a distinction, right? It becomes a place for certain kinds of people to consume and in attempt in a way to kind of keep out others. Needed a, a PA system. This was funded through Possible and kind of quite enthusiastically by local people. It raised 5,000 bucks in three days um, and, you know, was heavily embedded in the local network. Uh, there was kind of a fashion shops and record shops and Sound Summit and all these kind of things were organised at the time around it as well. It led to a bunch of um, underground artists and record labels kind of doing stuff in Newcastle that maybe they wouldn't have in the past. These kind of... Um, Bands and record labels often bypass Newcastle. Um, it was all done very much through Facebook networks and blogs. It wasn't kind of overt PR. So you can see here that the kind of things I'm describing very much fit the kind of more underground punk ethos. The aesthetics in that sense um, matched what the action was, you know, the practices of the place. But it also, in a way, serviced a wider community by having this kind of more mainstream space downstairs where people come and have a kind of fancy wine and and, and that kind of thing. Um, after a while, um, the owner negotiated um, and was in a, a good enough position to be able to buy the building uh, in partnership with some others, and that's since been sold and the place is now something else and he's moved on to something else. So what happens in this situation? What are the thems you have to manage to kind of keep this thing going? Well, firstly, there was happening in Newcastle at the time around this kind of moral panic about alcohol and violence, which led to the curfew in Newcastle. I uh, had to kind of negotiate a bunch of local police and licensing laws, the council. There's huge overheads when every time you kind of kind of do anything in a rented space, property maintenance, rent, staff, insurance, and all that kind of stuff. There was a kind of... Um, the, the Renew Newcastle was going on in the time. So this kind of constant debates about diversification and development going on in Newcastle. Um, so these are kind of real, uh, you know, bureaucratic and economic issues that um, you have to kind of face in a kind of realm where, you know, gigs are, before then were happening in much more kind of cheaper places, I suppose. There's also the maintenance of who you want to come to the bar to consume. And this was kind of, I think, done through quite symbolic mechanisms uh, the, the small bar maintained a distinction from the bigger beer barn places that were associated with moral panics around the alcohol and violence um, and was one of the first of the new bars, which around Newcastle, there's many now. Um, at the same time, there was there is other places where this stuff happened. So there's a bit of competition going on about where people can play or if a particular film night's going to happen here. And what also happens is as the bar becomes more established, becomes some people start to resent it in a way that it's got a success there's kind of distinctions and gossip and all that that goes on within the scene that also becomes a bit of a um a problem in terms of maintaining people coming to it and booking the gigs and stuff like that so the viability of the bar as a business maintains this the kind of is needed to maintain these distinctions that us and them kind of thing to make it cool to make the right people come there but also if you make it too niche you know, not enough people can come there and you struggle to keep your business open. What's interesting when we're talking about managing these lines is what Bourdieu has called the double language of disinterest. Um, so the, the examples that Bourdieu, Bourdieu uses is um, is when it comes to priests, you know, they, they, they don't ever talk about money, you know, and all this kind of stuff, but really in the end you've got to kind of make a donation and um, there's all this kind of double language where, the real um, object or the real function of a particular institution is hidden by this kind of broader um, rhetoric. So there's kind of a balancing act in the maintain maintenance of an underground bar, for instance, between keeping credibility and running sustainable business. So the choice of, you know, only serving boutique beers or, you know, particular wines is not just a display of good taste. It's a kind of also acts as a kind of symbolic form of exclusion whether this is reflexive or not, it doesn't really matter, but it's a way of kind of attracting the right people um, and maybe keeping out the wrong people. These are, in a sense, rational business decisions. They're a necessity in that sense, but they're likely cloaked in the language of kind of subcultures and subculture and expressions of taste. There's a kind of distinctive disinterest. So rather than kind of, you know, 
talking about how you need to have these specific brands or or kind of niche beers to kind of attract a certain crowd, you don't really talk about it in those marketing terms. It's more that um, talked about in terms of one's taste and good taste and, you know, things being good or bad or whatever. For these subcultural careers to be able to kind of maintain this kind of forms of capital, these reflexive understandings of one's own knowledge um, needs to be kind of maintained and invested um, to be able to make the business work. So from an analytical point of view, tracking these kinds of forms of subcultural capital through different fields is a way of thinking about how this works, how success or failure can happen. Um, and subcultural careers in this sense um, tend to be really reflexive, not very individualised, but often very fleeting, ephemeral and complex. It's really hard to keep these things going, um, particularly when things are open to fashion, open to changes, um, and particularly as things like rents and, and stuff like that are so expensive at the moment. So what's interesting here is what's kind of a form of capital in one field doesn't necessarily transfer into another. And um, to be able to kind of do this successfully, there's a whole bunch of negotiations and complex struggles to kind of get through to make this stuff work. Okay, I'll leave this bit there, and then I'll come back and talk about some young people who... Um, uh, who did what I call strategic poverty. <laughs> 